Well, hello, my MedTech friends. This is Mace Harf, and I want to welcome you again to the Medical Sales Guru Podcast and the Medical Sales Channel on YouTube. This week, I am doing something a little bit differently. I'm going to be interviewing an expert, a very relevant expert for what you do every day and throughout your career. Today, I'm going to be talking to Daniel Rooney. And Daniel is a private wealth advisor, his firm focuses specifically on the med tech community. And why would I bring Daniel on my show? Well, if, as you may know, and hopefully you know, that you work hard every day as a medical sales professional. And part of the plan overall is not just to earn money now, but to be able to prepare for your family and yourself long term financially. So Daniel is an expert in these areas. And what's very interesting about Daniel is prior to becoming a financial a private wealth advisor, Daniel spent over a decade in the medical device world as a senior sales professional. So number one, he understands what you do, he understands what your life is like. But more importantly, he's had a chance to look at it from the other side from the side of a private wealth advisor, and how to prepare for your future and also how to manage some things financially that you are going to be experiencing or you are experiencing in your life right now. So this is important stuff. Pay attention. And let me introduce you to Daniel Rooney. Daniel, thank you for being here. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, happy to be here. Excited to talk to you and, and to your, your audience. Very, very cool. All right. Well, let me ask you this. First of all, what area of MedTech did you work in? I worked in uh, pain and spine for well over a decade. Uh, I carried the bag for four plus years in spinal cord stimulators for Boston Scientific throughout the Los Angeles market, um, then got promoted into management and into sales management. So I spent a very long time with Boston and then got into a couple of different startups in the lumbar spinal stenosis space and then ultimately in the SI joint space. So very much around spine and the, uh, you know, the pain and ortho environment. Well, it, it's interesting that you were a specialist in the pain world, because what we're going to be talking about today is how to avoid a lot of the financial pain that medical reps can find themselves in if they don't do some preparation. So let me ask you this. Um, first of all, how did you make the transition? How did you go from medical sales into financial services? Uh, the great question, the one I always get asked, how did you make the transition? And there's really two layers to it. One I come from a long line of financial planners. So my mom and my stepfather, very successful investment advisory firm in the Northeast for Morgan Stanley. So I had been around it my whole life and really enjoyed uh, that uh, industry. And I really uh, admire folks who understand money and uh, the, the aspects around money and, and investing. But I wanted to find my own way. So I found my way into medical device because I really loved anatomy. I loved being with patients, working with physicians. But then ultimately, Having a family of my own, I realized that travel maybe wasn't the most uh, optimal place for me to be, is be gone from the, the children a lot of the time. So it was a natural organic transition because with the background of my family and the knowledge that I had, it would be very common for me to be at a national sales meeting or at a marketing event or, uh, you know, Aspen or one of these, you know, society meetings and talking to folks about investing and about planning and what do we do with dollars and how does it work for college funding and, uh, just really saw a door open for myself and for my family to make the shift and uh, be able to create something of my own. Now, what, what made you decide to focus in the medical device world from a financial perspective? I mean, what were you seeing there that gave you the thought this might be a good place to specialize? The medical device community, the med tech community is so unique, such a niche market. It's really a lifestyle more than a career. And so much of what they do has an aspect of clinical approach, patient engagement, operating room experience, sales experience. And with that came exposure to different aspects of the financial planning that really are gaps that I see quite often. And when I have these conversations, I really noticed that there wasn't a resource potentially for a lot of the folks that I, I was working hand in hand with. They're so busy. They get pulled in every direction. They might have a case at 5 a.m., but then it's postponed until 11 because the patient showed up late or ate a bagel or whatever it was. <laughs> and so 
you know, the, the navigation of trying to plan for individuals in that sector is, is something that I saw was a very big need. And I just thought, you know what, I really think this is an opportunity for me to leverage my past experience and tenure to go in a new direction that I can help them. And ultimately, you know, as we talked earlier, I love the education piece of life. I love helping folks understand and empower them to make good decisions. And I think this is the spot where uh, was for me. I think it's very interesting that you described it as a lifestyle, which it truly is. It's not always a desirable lifestyle, but it does capture your life. And as a result of that, you tend to focus on what's in front of you. Because as you said, Dan, you're always getting pulled in different directions when you're a medical rep. So financial planning or financial considerations oftentimes take a back seat to whatever's going on in your immediate life. How do you solve that problem? How do, how do you get medical reps to carve out the time to focus on these financial matters, which ultimately are why they're in the job in the first place? You know, that's the magic question that I'm still trying to solve, unfortunately, because they're so busy. But what I think the answer really comes down to is the relatability of understanding what their life is like. I know how busy they are and how uh, they can be pulled in a million different directions on a daily basis. And so our team is really good at making edits in terms of their schedule, in terms of meeting with them off hours, making it virtual rather than in person, whatever it may be. We work with uh, clients all over the country because of our, our niche background in MedDevice. Um, but what we really try to do is take them out of their busy merry girl round and pull them back and say, this is important stuff right? You are working so hard to create this income for your family. There is an absolute need for you to press pause. Give yourself, give your family the 45 minutes, an hour of dedicated time to really do an audit of what you're doing. Because otherwise, without a plan, you're really setting yourself up for a failure potentially in the future. Um, you know, we just had the Super Bowl yesterday and there was a lot of things that happened that they didn't plan for. You know, Odell Beckham getting hurt or a sack on a fourth down. Or, like, you don't plan for that stuff, but you have to create a plan in order to be successful in life. And that's what we really try to do is, is press pause. Let's do the time that's needed for this actual uh, uh, item in hand. So, Daniel, you made me think of something by quoting the Super Bowl, and you were talked about getting sacked on the fourth down. Back in March of 2020, um, a lot of people in this industry found themselves sacked with mm -hmm. their ability to create an income. So I don't know if you want to talk about that, but this is one crisis that, of course, anyone who's gone through it, you're never going to forget it, but there may be future crises to come. What can reps do or what should they be paying attention to in terms of preparing for those future crises, especially if they're a 1099 and independent? Yeah, listen, uh, it really comes down to one word, optionality. Folks, what does that mean? Optionality means where are you putting dollars, right? 1099 is different than W-2, depending on how you're creating income for yourself and what you're putting money into. But let's start with the W-2 employee. We'll get to the 1099. But the W-2 employee in February, March of 2020, their 401k was a disaster. 401ks are very, very heavily weighted in the U.S. economy, and it was down 35 40%. So that's what I mean by optionality. You need other items in your portfolio than a 401k and a home. It's just not enough to retire with that anymore. And there's tons of analytics around that. And our firm can help you navigate that situation. For that's, that's retirement. That's, that's retirement. I definitely want to talk about that. We're going to get into that. But in terms of dealing with the unforeseen financial crisis, crises, which may arise in between, can you provide any advice on that? Yeah. So there's very much a strategy around dollars that are there for your protection. What is in place for your catastrophic event? What have you planned for in terms of the earth goes flat like it did in 2020? And we're having a zombie apocalypse around COVID. You know, have you done the due diligence to create a strategy that is a triage effects? Meaning when the first thing goes wrong, what's the emergency fund? When the second thing goes wrong, where's our midterm savings? Uh, if it continues, where are we pulling assets from, depending on where we've put dollars because of taxes? Where are we pulling it from? There's so many things to think about and layers of defense that need to be put in place for individuals for those events that if you're not preparing properly, 
you wake up in, you know, April of 2020 and you have no income because they've stopped all elective surgeries. What's your plan? How long can you live on the money that's in your checking account if you haven't built a strategy around those events happening? Well, you know, we all as human beings have this tendency to procrastinate. Uh, right now, it, it, we're in the middle of tax season. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, the IRS is very slow, et cetera, et cetera, but it's tax season. So we want to file by April 15th, unless they extend the deadline, what have you. Human nature oftentimes lead people to wait until it's like a week before tax deadline, then rush to their accountant or their tax preparation expert to, to get the job done. We don't have the luxury of some sort of signal or sign that we're about to have another crisis. So how can you motivate or compel sales representatives to do something now? I mean, what would be the first step? You know, considering you know the life of a sales rep and uh, they're, they're working frantically throughout the day. They're going to get home. They just want to spend time with their family, put their feet up, drink a beer, watch TV, whatever it is. What can you say to them to get them to take action now? I mean, I think our most relevant information is the event we just went through of COVID. Yeah. If as of today, February 14th, 2022, you don't understand the fact that the world can stop, that pandemics, epidemics can happen, catastrophic events can happen, and you don't have the foresight to say, we need to have a plan. I mean, we all just lived it for two years. For about six or eight months, we all pressed pause and lived in our living room and watched the news to see what was going on. So right now, the relevance to those sales reps is we just lived through it. We know it's possible. If that's not on the forefront of your mind, then we need to talk about something because you don't want to go through that situation again and not have a strategy in place. And I think prior to that event, it was a little bit harder because people thought, eh, I'll be okay. We as humans feel like we're somewhat invincible. It won't happen to me. I'll be okay. I'll get to it at some point. When the reality is, is it just happened. And we know that there's other factors on the horizon that are going to happen again. So we absolutely ask, what's the most important thing? How do we help you press pause for 45 minutes and do a full audit of what you're doing and what your needs are? and then create some recommendations. And then it's up to you. Are you educated and empowered to make a decision on those action items? That's up to you, but at least you've done the due diligence. Let me, let me ask you this question just popped into my head. Is there a certain income level at which medical reps really should start putting together a plan? Like for example, if you have new reps that are starting out, a lot of times they're on a, a salary or a draw versus commission situation. And they might be earning a more humble income than they will eventually earn. Is there some point when you should start paying attention? What are your thoughts on that? Our rule of thumb is always as soon as possible. Um, the biggest asset that these individuals have are the length of their career, meaning the run with it, which they have to save. There's very few Tom Brady's or Adele's in the world that just get tons of money thrown at them. The very smart individual, the wealthy ones in life are the ones who strategically put away dollars month after month, year after year throughout the runway of their life of earnings career. So if you put it in a perspective of a, a sports event, like we just saw yesterday, there's four quarters to your life in terms of savings, 25 to 35, 35 to 45, 45 to 55, and 55 to 65. If you miss any one of those, you're, you miss a quarter of your life. If you think between 25 and 35, this isn't important to me. This is not relevant. You've lost 25% of the years in which you can earn to save. So now we come down to percentages of your income and what's appropriate. We don't want to derail your monthly lifestyle in terms of making you live eating ramen noodles. Uh, but there are, there are appropriate measures that you should be taking early on in your career, importantly, to set disciplines that you're doing this commission check after commission check year over year to set yourself up. No one's ever looked back in life and said, I wish I didn't save that money. Nobody. Yeah, definitely. So are there any financial issues that are unique to medical device reps? Are there patterns that you see um, in areas where they've, they've not thought about that they tend to leave to chance that's harming them now or could harm them in the future? I mean, obviously, we've been talking about retirement. 
what are some of your um, the other things that they need to plan for? Yeah, I think there's two areas, maybe three, really, that I look at. One is uh, a lot of the medical device community will get commissions through RSUs or ESPP, some sort of stock compensation package. And they're really tied to the company performance in terms of the stock price, which are great because it's an alternative measure of compensation. But a lot of reps will look at that and say, I want to hold on to it. I really love my company. I love my job. And so you'll find folks who have been at a career for five, six, seven, even 10 years, and they got a couple hundred thousand dollars of these stock options. And it's tied to one company. And in our opinion, that may not be the most ideal strategy. So that exposure potentially could be harmful to them in the future. Um, in today's cancel culture, it can be one CEO doing one wrong thing, and then that stock price plummets. So we want to educate them on what's the most appropriate measure for that. A unique question and perspective we always ask our clients is, is if you had, uh, hypothetically, say you had $200,000 of one stock for whatever company X, and I asked them, I'd say, hey, Mace, if you had $200,000 in cash, would you buy $200,000 of X company? And almost to a person, they say no. Right. Well, then why are we holding that much in one company? So how do we diversify? That's one. Um, Two, medical device reps are very much exposed on the disability part of life, the risk management part of life. Um, they are almost identical and run parallel lives as a physician in terms of what they do on a daily basis. Clinical settings, operating room, patient engagement, carrying product, carrying a bag, working with the, you know, the value analysis teams, et cetera. If they don't have proper risk management in place and they're disrupted as far as work, their income goes away. And so in medical school and in you know, undergrad and fellowship for uh, physicians, they're almost mandated to get disability insurance because that's where their income is going to be created. But we never talk to the medical device community about protecting their income. You know, and that can be dramatically slashed if there's an event where they can't work. And so one, one of the, the activities that medical reps do a lot of is driving in a car. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all know if, if you've spent any time at a company every year, there's, uh, I remember I, I spent a lot of my time in a company, which at the time had about 500 sales reps, there was an average of one death fatality uh, for a year due to an auto accident, but there were several other injuries where people were disabled. So it's a it's a serious consideration. I mean, there, this is not a risk free job. Let me ask you, um, millennials, Gen X, whether it's fair or not, they have a reputation for becoming easily dissatisfied with jobs and jumping from company to company. If someone is of that mindset, are there any special things they should put in place if, they're, if they plan to move around a lot? Yes, yes, 100%. Because um, if you're jumping around quite a bit, uh, your benefits per company are going to vary dramatically on what they're going to offer you. So there may be some really prudent activity to put in privately held placement for disability or life coverage. Um, also, 401ks. You, you, in our opinion as a firm, we don't recommend that you leave your 401k at the uh, previous employer. You are no longer an employee there. They're no longer supplementing the benefits program to help pay for that 401k. Uh, the 401k program run by a third party administrator has an allegiance to the company, not to you. So creating an IRA that you can drop your 401ks into, so you own them, you can contribute to them, you have uh, investment strategies with them. When they're just off in purgatory somewhere, that's a bad situation potentially. So there's some risk issues there. There's some investment issues there. Um, I know there's a lot of reps that we work with that do like to jump from place to place because of the startup world or equity compensations, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and we manage that appropriately because we need to have one protection in place and an investment and strategy in place when they do move from place to place with their assets. So medical reps oftentimes, you know, operate as lone wolves, even though mm -hmm. there's in the sales aspect of their job, there's lots of help available to them. They have sales managers, they have people like myself, they could turn to or you, they tend to have a belief that they could do it on their own, and they want to do it on their own. It, there's this need of amongst people who are very motivated sometimes to succeed on their own as opposed to seeking help. So 
you know, number one, what would you say to um, the reps who think that they can manage this on the on their own with a, an E Trade or a Charles Schwab account or something like that? Because you know, you see the commercials all the time. We'll we'll show you how to invest your money and you know how to do it without an advisor. Um, what would you say to them? And uh, then then I'll come up. I'll come back with a follow up question. You know, what do you say to the people who think they could do it on their own? I run into that almost every day, and there's a really fun way I like to manage that with them. Um, and I know hundreds of sales reps across the country from my tenure in medical device. And so I get asked the questions all the time of, you know, new jobs, et cetera, because I'm still in the market. And so I'll check up on individuals who make a career shift and I'll say, hey, Mace, how's the new territory going? How's building up the new market? And I'll get quite a bit of, you know, these doctors won't even let me in their account. They won't even let them see me. They just told me that they're, they're good. And then I'll ask them, well, you know, have you, talk, have you thought about us having a conversation about the planning items we discussed? And then they say to me, Oh, I'm good. I'm good. So they're doing to me exactly what's being done to them. So that fixed mindset is the barrier uh, that we have to break through. And so the lone wolf mentality is we have to break through the emotional barrier of I can do this myself by sharing experiences. Like example, do you do your own taxes? Probably not because you don't want to make a mistake on your taxes and get audited and you want to get the maximum amount of return. You hire a professional to do something that you're not in the industry of. We are no different. We're of service to you to break down, deconstruct, and audit all of your portfolio and affirm and answer the question that most people always want to ask themselves, which is, are we going to be okay? Do I have enough money? And so we have to really, it's the emotional component, the emotional component of I'm okay. I'm a mercenary. I got it all covered. So we have to give them examples of how that they potentially may not be. And then hopefully we get through and and they're open to a growth mindset, which is let's let's hear what you're talking about, and and let me you know uh, kind of audit what I'm doing. All right. So let's say that someone is watching the video or listening to the podcast, and they said, "Yeah, I need to get a financial advisor." Where should a medical device sales representative, or anyone who works in you know in sales or in the medical device industry, what steps should they take to find? a financial advisor who could help them based on their career path? I think the first and foremost thing is you got to find someone that you like. I mean, the logistics around the intimacy of what you're sharing with them. You're opening up yourself and saying, this is the money I have. This is the money I have or have not saved. This is my family and this is my goals. So you got to find someone that you can trust. And ideally, you want to have someone that you're going to be able to work with for the next decade or two or three, depending on your age bracket. Um, so uh, what we know through analytics is that most folks will not Google financial advisor. And you're not going to find someone with their face on a park bench or on a bus. They want to be referred. So we work strictly on a referral basis, meaning we know the medical device community. And we've been really well known in this industry for a couple of years now. And so people reach out to us because they know that I know the space. I know the benefits package of most of these folks. But what I would say to the folks listening is talk to, talk to somebody, find someone that you've been referred to, find someone that you trust, find someone who has a background and knowledge of your specific industry. Because the niche industry of med device is very different than a tech salesperson, very different in terms of the needs and what they're exposed to versus someone who's not carrying a bag, driving 30,000 miles a month and in the operating room. Yeah, well, if somebody who's driving 30,000 uh, 30, miles a month, that's probably a bit excessive. But, you know, in this world, it, it probably could happen. Um, one of the difficulties, I think, in choosing a financial advisor is how do you know they're good? I mean, recommendations are one thing. And, and to, to give you sort of a comparison, we often hear all the times, for those of us who spent a lot of time in the operating room, you hear about a surgeon who has a great reputation. You know, he gets referred all the time. But if you've been in the operating room with him, you go, oh, gosh, I, I wouldn't let that guy cut my fingernails. Uh, but yet he's got a great reputation, probably because of a wonderful bedside manner. There, the same thing is, is potentially possible with a financial advisor. Is there a way to validate the experience or the track record of a, of a financial advisor? And is that necessary or feasible? I mean, that's a great question. I don't know if there's a, a way to check the track record. I think the referral that you get to that individual will speak volumes. If you trust the individual that's referring you, 
um, that will speak volumes of the individual. I think credentialing, um, you know, our team, we have CFPs, RICA, CHFCs, CPA. I mean, we have the whole litany on our team. Um, so I think that when I, when I would recommend someone else to look for a financial advisor, credentials, who do they work with? Do they understand your industry? Have you been referred to them or have you heard good things about them? Um, and then you can always check, you know, uh, FINRA or the SEC for any um, uh, legal action against their license. Yeah. So that's another layer you could take. Um, check their website, see what they offer. Does it align with your values? Um, check them on LinkedIn, see what they post, what's their post likes. Those are some of the generic things that I would say um, to that question. Yeah, well, um, you know, a lot of people probably believe that if they're a high income earner, then they need to find a financial advisor who deals with high income earners, such as doctors, lawyers, professionals. What are the advantages to working with someone who really understands the medical device world, the, the healthcare sales world? How is that different from just going to someone who's used to dealing with people with high incomes? Taxes. 100% the answer is taxes. The tax burden on the investment strategies that you choose are unrealized. And by the time you can realize them, potentially it's too late. So there are some very unique strategies that high income earners can use or leverage to mitigate some of the tax drag that they have on some of the options that they choose. And there's tons of research on it and uh, understanding the complexity around certain wealth levels and how to mitigate the drag of where your income is going based off of taxes is, is absolutely paramount when it comes to those individuals. Can you think of a particular instance for a medical device person uh, where they're leaving money on the table by ignoring or being unaware of a particular tax strategy? Can you give me an example? So if you look at investment options, 401k, pretty standard for someone to have, or an IRA. Um, hard to believe, but there's a, a pretty large subset of people in the world who don't understand the ordinary income drag that that 401k and our IRA will have upon distribution. It's going to be taxed at ordinary income, which is your highest marginal tax bracket. So if you have a million dollars in your 401k, the reality is you probably have about 700, maybe 650 because the IRS has not gotten their money yet. You're putting money into the market, capital gains, short-term or long-term, 15 to 20%, depending on how long you're holding it. People love real estate. Real estate can be a huge burden on taxes because your real estate income is taxed as ordinary income. Doing a 1031 exchange, how are you doing it? Is it appropriate when you're selling or buying a new house? So you have to come up with alternative instruments that are in a tax-free bucket. That's one thing because everything you have is painted in the corner of Taxes, that's a problem. The other positioning piece that we know uh, specifically from 2008 market crash of the real estate market is off market assets. Meaning if everything you have is based off of the market and you are solely based in a taxable market-based instruments, you could be in a huge problem if the market crashes and you're in a distribution phase. So what do you have that's off market? Again, tax-free, off market versus in market and taxable. There's a bunch of different strategies there. And it, it comes down to which lever do you need to pull when you want the money? Is it for a wedding? Is it for college funding? Is it for a new house? Is it for retirement? Doesn't matter. Having the options around that is really what we're trying to accomplish because you can't be painted it in one bucket. You're going to be in, in a problematic situation. Let's, uh, let me give you, a, I'll make up a scenario. Let's say you have a, a sales representative. Let's say he's 45 or 50 years old has not taken any steps to prepare for retirement, no financial plan. If you're late in your career, what should you do while you still have some time for it to make a difference? What would you recommend? I mean, at minimum, you got to start saving. Um, we absolutely, one of the first wow. things we recommend- Saving is a general term. How, how should yeah. they start saving? No, that, so I was going to get to that. So what we absolutely recommend, not everything we do, we can help with, with clients. Meaning, if there's something left on the table, we absolutely want to make sure that we're maximizing employee benefits. Are you taking advantage of everything that the company is supplementing you? Are you putting into the 401k? Are you getting the match? 
some of the, the larger companies that we all know, Boston, Medtronic, Stryker, J&J, they all do a company match of your 401k. Are you even contributing to that? Now, I can't manage that for you. I can't help you with that. Other advisors can't either. But are you putting money in there? If you're putting in 6% and they're giving you 6%, you're getting 100% return on your money before it's even invested. We got to maximize those opportunities. So that's the first thing we look at. Where are we leaving money on the table? Second thing is, is goals. What are we looking at as far as retirement? What age do you want to retire? What income do we want to retire on? And then how do we deconstruct that and start to put together a plan of getting there? We add in social security. We take into account inflation, market returns over the last 50 years. We start to do some analysis on what it is we're on track for. And then we slowly start to peel away uh, uh, answers to that question. Financial planning with me or with anyone else is not a silver bullet. It's a fluid environment that changes day over day, year over year. We don't plan for a death in the family. We don't plan for our kids to get sick. We don't plan for a car crash. But all of these things take effect over life. So the plan needs to be fluid. And so the answer to that question is you got to start and have a plan, but let's maximize the opportunity we have of the low hanging fruit. Yeah, we don't, we don't plan for situations like COVID. And that's been a wake up call for a lot of us. Uh, you will oftentimes hear uh, people say that retirement just sort of creeps up on you. I think for most of the people I know, what they'll tell you is that they blink and one day it's just here. And when it happens, you're either prepared for it or you're not. When we have the next crisis after COVID, and there will be another crisis, there's always another crisis, you're either prepared to withstand it, to survive it, or you're not. So I think one of the best things you could do, and what I really encourage the people who are watching this or listening to this, if you work in the medical device world, and you know how much you mean to me, uh, because we come from the same cloth. Uh, I really encourage you to whatever situation you're in right now, take action, do something, talk to a professional. And uh, Daniel, in case somebody wants to talk to you, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, I appreciate that. And listen, let me just uh, uh, co-sign that, which is if you're talking to somebody, that's great. If you don't have someone, please reach out to somebody. Um, absolutely get on a plan. If someone wants to reach me specifically, they can find me on LinkedIn, Daniel J. Rooney. You can go on my website, which is danielrooney.nm.com. Uh, you can email me at daniel.rooney at nm.com. Um, our team would be happy to help uh, guide you in the right direction. Thank you so much, Daniel. I think this is a very different podcast. Uh, normally, I spend my time talking about how to make more money, how to make more sales, by having a strategy and a plan. But ultimately, the reason we do those things is so we can generate an income to fuel our lives, take care of our families and fuel our future. So uh, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about this very important subject. And this session you and I spent together will be successful only if people do something, they take action now, they look at their financial situation now, and they contact a professional to have better control moving into the future. So thank you so much for your time, Daniel. And uh, I will have Daniel's contact information on the podcast page. And I'll also put it across the screen for the video. So Daniel, thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Rooney, uh, who spent time with us from uh, Daniel, where are you in Southern California? Correct. Irvine, California. In California. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Uh, my friends, I always end these podcasts by saying that, remember, no matter what you do in your medical sales career, nothing is more important than the patient. That's when you're making decisions that impact a patient's life or a provider's life or taking care of that patient. What we talked about today is taking care of your life. So today I'm going to end by saying that, uh, remember, as you move forward in your career, to also take care of yourself and your own financial future. Thanks for being with me this week on the Medical Sales Guru Podcast and the Medical Sales Channel. I again, thank Daniel Rooney for being my guest. And I look forward to seeing you again on another episode. Would you like to learn how to leverage hidden opportunities in the post pandemic world to ethically sell more while working less? This free 15-minute training reveals three little-used secrets that are helping medical sales and other high-stakes sales reps to generate jaw-dropping sales increases without resorting to sleazy sales tactics. For more information, go to sellmorelesstime.com. That's sellmorelesstime.com.